that our God reigns in this city? How many believe that our God reigns in the earth? Everybody come on! We're taking territory. Today we are talking about evangelism. This is Church, episode six, season one, and we're talking about evangelism. Isn't it amazing that even during Business Garage we are talking about evangelism in business, also known as marketing? Okay, so I have a little time, so I need to figure out what to do. So here is the main point no evangelism, no growth. Yeah. In fact, let me make two main points. One, no evangelism, no growth. Yeah. Five plus zero equals five, even with prayer and fasting and tongues. It doesn't change. Then you keep trying. You try your calculator and see. Even if you do it several times, yeah, the answer will be the same without intentional invitation of people to Christ the church can't grow amen no evangelism no growth the second you are the evangelist yeah say I am called to evangelize yeah. Evangelism is not for the pastors of the church, for the leaders only. Of course, I'm also called to be an evangelist. It is all of us. There is no one whom Jesus said, you, you can tell people about me. You, no. Hey, you want to tell people about Jesus? No, no, no. Come on. No, that's everyone. So two points. No evangelism. Everyone is doing. You see, in this church, we used to do evangelism the wrong way. So first of all, let me confess some sins. We started by not doing evangelism. Yeah, at worship purpose, you'd come, no altar call, nothing. You wouldn't even know whether people want people to get saved. We said, you know, we will just teach them. Somehow they will find out. So we didn't grow. Then we started being intentional about evangelism. We did the one campaign. Remember that? and things like that. So we reached a point where we would have, I, I think the best year we had about 500 people give their lives to Christ, inviting them to Christ here at garage, in different garage spaces. And then the Lord opened our eyes that we were not doing it the right way. We were trying to do evangelism here instead of doing it there where the people are. And so we commissioned all our missional communities to become our evangelism champions. Whereby we ask that every missional community should lead at least one person to Christ a week. From when we adopt, adopted that strategy, we have now reached where we are now having more than 500. Let me see what did we have this week. I told you the number. Yeah, 538. We are now having in the region of 500 salvations a week. Look, you move from 500 a year to 500 a week. That's in the region of 2,000 per month. That's why Worship Harvest is growing. We used to grow very, very slowly. Organic growth, like some of your businesses which don't market. You have organic growth and you're happy. Yeah, you're so happy with the organic growth because you don't know there is something else. And then we started intentional evangelism and being serious about it. Look, from 20, from this time last year when we were about 3,500 attending garage, we, our garage attendance is now, as of last week, it was 9,700 in less than a year because we have shifted the strategy from 
come, let's tell you about Jesus to we are coming to tell you about Jesus. Am I making sense? We've shifted from come, let's tell you about Jesus to we are coming to tell you about Jesus. You know, imagine a business which only tells people about itself when they come to it. Huh? Until you, all your advertising is internal. Until someone walks through that door, they will not know that you exist. That business can't grow. Now, I'm not talking about your business. I'm just talking about those other businesses of people who think that customers are supposed to discern their existence, somehow bring themselves, even ask, do you sell charcoal? Yes, we sell charcoal. Oh, good. Then they start buying. So when a church operates like that, it can't change the world. Evangelism must be very intentional. And the purpose of this message is that if you are truly a follower of Jesus and you are in this church, by the time I'm done, you should have signed up. There will be no signing up anywhere because that should be everyone. To be actively involved in evangelism. Are you with me? Acts 1.8 Acts 1.8 is a scripture we've come to know and love together, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Jesus said, this is the purpose. This is what will happen. What will, what, what will it become? What will happen? You shall become witnesses now, there are so many other expressions and things that happen when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, right? Like in the upper room, they spoke in tongues. In another place, chapter 5, I think, the house shook. In, those, in chapter 19, Paul laying hands on them, they spoke in tongues. There are many things that happen, right? They spoke in tongues, the house shook, they were filled with boldness, etc. But the main thing to know that a church has been visited by the Holy Spirit is they start doing evangelism. They become witnesses. Yeah. It's not enough to fall. It's not enough to shake. It's not enough to laugh. <laughs> it's not enough to experience all the other experiences. After falling, shaking, laughing, what else? Trembling shouting crying which are all great stuff the next stage is what witnesses you tell the story of jesus and how he changed your life and how he can change the life of other people amen it's powerful you know the gospel is very powerful the gospel can turn around a life and a family and a community and a nation. That's why we must do evangelism. You'll find that a lot of the problems we are trying to solve are just evangelism problems. Am I making sense? You see, my parents were Abazukufu. They were of that branch of Christianity which had to be practical. And I appreciate that side of the gospel that if you're a Christian, you had to have, we grew up in the village, you had to have a katandalo. Do you know a katandalo? The thing where after you've washed your plates and cups, you put them to dry, you make it nicely with four poles and sticks. You don't just leave your things there like that. Now, just that small action can change a home because of the levels of hygiene going up, people stopping to fall sick so they can go to school, etc., etc. It, it's evangelism can change a community. Yeah. You find that if you are a local Mzukufu, you had to have a latrine in the village. While other people just used to go in the bushes, you, you, you had to have one. That's how lives are changed. Am I making sense? The gospel changes. I know, I know someone who lived a life of you know extreme on the extreme 
they, 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 they chain smoked for 27 years. Started smoking P6. Yeah. They drank so much that they learned how to drink without getting drunk. And then they became coaches. You know how you coach people? This is how you drink the whole night and not get drunk. And they are coach. Very well known. People come to them. Teach me. I want to drink without getting drunk. Hey. And then they met Jesus. This person now runs a hosting center in worship harvest. They are now pastors. That's what I mean the gospel can do. If the gospel can change someone that much, everyone needs the gospel. Yeah. All those men who are beating their wives, they need the gospel. Yeah. Urgently, moreover. Because it changes you inside out. Yeah. Are you, are you with me? The gospel has serious implications, spiritual implications, social implications, economic implications. So, it's an urgent call for us to become witnesses, witnesses of Jesus. And the interesting thing is says that this witness of yours will not end in Jerusalem, but you go to Judea. Your influence will increase as a witness. If you stay in Jerusalem, the gospel won't reach you there. <laughs> and then Samaria. And then the ends of the earth. I think God is inviting us, isn't he? Mark 16, 15, 16 says, And he said to them, let's read together, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Condemned by who? Not by God. God did not send his son into the world, condemn the world, but the world is already under condemnation. It's a bit like if they put up a couple of houses and they say, go tell people to come and sleep inside. He who comes in will have a warm bed. He who stays out will be cold. What makes you cold is not because you are sent out of the house. What makes you cold is because you refuse to come into the house. Condemnation is in the world not because God condemns, but because condemnation is in the world. And when you come into Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. It is essential that we preach the gospel. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, very, very interesting verse. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. That's where God is taking some people who are listening to me, both here and online. Your life is going to get to that point where you will cry out that cry. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Necessity is laid upon me. Once you have a revelation of the love of God and the hardness and hardship of the world and how every single human being is only one step away from stepping out of that extreme situation, into extreme love even you you'll be gripped by the conviction that it is necessary necessity is laid upon me necessity is laid upon me may you have a revelation of what we're talking about you see sometimes when you've been in church too long you forget how painful it is in the world we just enjoy 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 but i want to thank you worship harvest because you have been responding to this call. You've been going out. You've been inviting people into a relationship with Jesus. You've been inviting them into your missional communities. And people are finding love like Rona who 
whose testimony we had, she's now a pastor. How did it start? She caught into a mission of community. She got called the next day. People took down her number. We are checking on you. Now she wants to do the same for others. You know, Billy Graham is considered one of the greatest evangelists of all time. But did you know that someone had to preach to Billy Graham? The greatest evangelists of all time that we haven't yet seen are waiting for you to go preach to them. You can lead a person to Christ who can lead 50 million people to Christ. Yeah. You can disciple a person who can disciple 100 million people. Necessary. Once you have the revelation, it ceases to be a thing of, should we do this or not? No. Necessity. Necessity. I, I'm seeing here Joshua Weiswa, who is spearheading the massacre hosting center. That, that's called necessity. A man drives to massacre every Sunday. Why? Why? Yeah, living behind his beautiful wife. She, I'll see you when I'm back. Hey. They call that necessity. There is a conviction. Somehow it's not okay for me to just stick around here where, you know, do you know that in church after four years you've pretty much had everything that, that's to be preached. Yeah, that's why people move churches. Because they realize the pastor is starting to repeat himself after four years. Uh, yeah, this guy is still telling us about uh, they move on no it's not because you are supposed to move to another church you are supposed to start one uh, yeah, you see even in university three years certificate now go and practice but in church it's like teach them to death hey! I thank God for worship harvest it's not one of those churches yes here we release people into greatness. We say, go, give it a shot. If it doesn't work, you have a home, you can come back. You will not find when your plastic chair has been taken. It will be here. Yeah, you try that hosting center. If it doesn't work, come back. Your plastic seat is waiting for you. Necessity is laid upon me. I feel like I'm preaching. Ah, uh, are you ready to go? Yeah. You know, every single person on the earth has someone God has prepared for them to preach the gospel to them. I believe it. I believe that different people have been set up by God to reach different people. And when you don't go out and reach your people, I will reach the ones God set up for me to reach, but yours will not be reached. Yeah, you'll get to heaven and realize you left a lot of people in hell who only you were positioned to lead to Christ. May God lay the necessity upon you to preach the gospel like Paul. Amen. Let me give you some statistics. In the world today, these are sort of estimates of religions. Christianity has 2.168 billion followers. That's only 31.4%. You see, when you live in, in Uganda, you think that everyone is a Christian. That's why we need to quickly go. Finish your four years here and go, go start somewhere, even in other countries. Because only 31% Christian, and that includes everyone. Those who lift their chairs and those who light candles. In between, and everything in between. Yeah. Only 31%. Muslims, 1.6 billion, 23.2%. A quarter of the world is Islam, is Islamic. Non-religious, agnostic, atheist, 1.1 billion. Apparently. That's a little bit of confused. Hinduism, 1.1 billion. That's another 15%. Buddhism, 506 million. Chinese traditional religions, 394 million. Ethnic religions, 300 million. African tradi traditional religions, 100 million. And then many other small breakdowns. I was fascinated by this list of irreligious people. People who say they are not religious. 
China, 720 million. Like not any religion, not Christianity, not Islam, not Buddhism, not what, just, yeah, I'm, I'm there, there, yeah. Yeah, I'm like a cow. When I die, yeah, meat. 720 million, that's several nations in one. Japan, 74 million. America, 62 million. Most of those are pretenders because they, they have something inside. They, they will say, I don't believe until something happens. Then everyone say, pray for. Pray for Texas. I thought you don't believe. Vietnam, 28 million. South Korea, 23 million. Russia, 21 million. Germany, 21 million. France, 20, mil 20 million. United Kingdom, 20 million. North Korea, 18 million. Brazil, 17 million. Spain, 10 million. Canada, 9 million. Czech Republic, 8 million. South Africa, 8 million. Italy, 8 million. Netherlands, 7.5 million. Mexico, 7 million. Australia, 7 million. Ukraine, 5.3. Argentina, 5.3. Mozambique, 5 million. Now, what gets interesting is when you see that all your donor countries are on the list. <laughs> and realize something is about to, to hit you hard if you don't do something about it now. Are you with me? On the day of Pentecost, you see this thing that Jesus is telling them. The Holy Spirit will come up and you will be witnesses. When the Holy Spirit came, what was the first thing that happened? Evangelism was the first order of business after the Holy Spirit had come upon them. When they met in the upper room, they started praying for 10 days. And the first thing they did was correct the structure by replacing Judas, right? And then the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit came, there is no church without the Holy Spirit. The first order of business was evangelism. Just like we were saying in the, in the morning, the first order of business for any business is marketing. The first order of business for any Christian, any church is evangelism. So the Bible says in uh, verse 40 and 41 of chapter 2 of Acts, give it to us. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, this is Peter talking to them, what? Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word, are you there? Were what? Baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. A mega church was born on day one, from 120 to 3,120. Because of evangelism. You can have exponential growth if you adopt evangelism. Locations, cohorts, missional communities. You see this strategy of missional communities bringing one person to Christ a week. It means that your missional community grows by one person a week as a bare minimum. So if you start out as 10 people, after two and a half months, you'll be 20. After five months, Jan to June, you'll be how many? Roughly four by five, 20 plus 10, 30. You'll be ready to birth a mission of community. And then you repeat. Let's say that 30 of you become three mission of communities because you had hurdles. And then the three, after the break in June, July to November, you each reach another 20. So now, by November, you are what? 90. So 10 people can become 90 people in a year if you do evangelism. So let me ask you, the mission committee you're a part of, how long has it been going and how many are you? A little one shall become a thousand, not by accident, by evangelism. Quietness Presbyterian Church has just joined us. Welcome. Uh, Rolling Stones, Catch No Most International Ministries of the Holy Ghost Fire, shouting with your chair up in the air, has just left the room. <coughs> they have left the group. Are you there? Ten people 
a missional community of 10 people who are serious about Jesus will be 90 people. That's a location in a year, one year. Hey, are you with me? It's not complicated. You see, you, you assume that people don't want to know God. No. They have been told all the wrong things about God. They are suspicious. Now go tell them the good news. That their daddy loves them. And wants to do great things for them. Every human being has a gap. Internal gap. They will try to fill it with so many things. And you know, it doesn't work. Only God can feel that knowing. Okay. G-N-A-W-I-N-G -G for those who are wondering. Only God. Only God. So people need the Lord urgently. So, life went on. Peter and John went to the temple, healed a crippled man. They were taken into the Sanhedrin. By the time that whole fracas was over, 5,000 people had given, had come to the Lord. Acts 4-4. Four, four. However, many of those who had the word believed and the number of men came to about 5,000. Wow. This church was, now that's a double mega church. It was rapid growth. And then Philip went to Samaria. You see, Jesus had said you'd be what? Witnesses where? Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and the other most ends of the earth. And we see in the scripture that the first person to, to crack the Samaria code was Philip. I'm going to tell you something very interesting about Philip. Even as I watch my watch. Very interesting about Philip. Let's read. Let's read Acts 8, 4 to 8. What does it say? Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. What happened? They were scattered because first they refused to go then persecution came and they had to go so philip went to samaria verse 5 then philip went down to the city of samaria and preached christ to them you're about to find out something interesting if i were you in fact i would get my interest ears on right now uh-huh and the multitudes with one accord i can't hear you reading he did the thing spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Next, for un unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now you find that finally the gospel has reached Samaria. Samari the Samaritans were the descendants of the mixture of the northern tribes of Israel and the Assyrians. And so the Jews who were from the south, from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, they didn't like them because they were mixed. That's why Jesus had issues when he told them, we are going through Samaria. And they're like, what are we going to, you are going through, they are going to stone us. So it was, it was like, what? In, there was some cultural distance between Judea and Samaria. So Judea was very familiar environment, everything same. Samaria was a little bit different culture, but still with a Jewish heritage. So it wasn't very far culturally, but there was some cultural distance. You know when you're doing evangelism, there are different cultural distances. When people speak the same language as you, it's different from if you're going to preach in Japan. Because not only is the language a problem, the culture is an issue. You will expect people to behave a certain way, they behave differently. They eat different stuff. So the farther you go from where you are with all the cultural barriers, the more determined you need to be as a missionary because it gets more complex. But this was like medium distance in terms of the cultural distance. But stuff happened. Now, <sighs> I heard this from Bishop Doug and I've since come to believe it. If you want to know that you are anointed, hmm? yeah? So first of all, you are anointed, but you don't know, go to Samaria. Yeah. Yeah. If you stay in Jerusalem, whoa, whoa, 
your anointing will even disappear. Because those people, they don't know, they don't think you're anointed. Yeah, they are so used to you. Uh, Philip, with this guy. Look, in all the reading, you did you see that Philip was performing any miracles in Jerusalem? Where any people being healed and lame walking, it is see. No, Philip only saw those things in his ministry when he left Jerusalem and went to Samaria. You see, some of you, your MC, your, your an MC leader, your mission, your, lead, your members don't even think there's even a little bit of anointing in you. And the only way you're going to salvage your anointing is to get up, go and minister somewhere else. Yeah. For me, even here at Worship Harvest, yeah, thankfully for me, I know that I'm anointed. You can't scare me out of it, even if you want. But when I go to other churches, the response is very different from here. Even, from, even within worship service, when I go to other locations, the response is different from here at Nalia. Yeah, the people of Nalia, yeah, Moses, yeah, what, yeah. yeah. We go to the toilet together, what? Drink, drinks black tea, I drink black tea, what? Be easy, man. When I go to other locations, the way they receive me, I see the move of the Holy Spirit there that I don't see here. More people get saved when I preach in other locations that are not here. Healings, what? Mighty stuff, yeah. People being filled, speaking in tongues for the first time. Crazy stuff happens elsewhere. Here, very little. So I have learned how to protect my anointing. Yeah. I preach here very little, then I go somewhere else. Yeah. Says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Yeah. That's a scripture. So there are people who they will not receive you because you are their own. But to those who received him, he gave the power. Yeah. Some people remain wise. They are like, even if he's our own, we are going to receive him. Even if she's our own MC leader, we are going to receive her. Even if he's our own cohort shepherd, we are going to receive him. So they keep tapping the anointing because they've figured out how to receive people they are used to. But most people don't know how to do it. It's just natural. When you're so used to someone, it's very difficult to receive them as an anointed person. So most people, they only realize what God really put in their lives when they get out of familiar environments. That's the same with you, Kamara. You know, you have to go preach somewhere else. I mean, but you have been invited. I'm sure you've seen how things work when you go other places than in your cohort in uh, Zone 3. <laughs> Pastor, that has tickled you the wrong way. <laughs> Stuff started happening. What's it, Are you with me? If you want to know that you are anointed, go for Frontier. Go for evangelism. When your MC is going for evangelism, go for evangelism. You will see demons fleeing. You'll be like, eh, me, I cast out demons. You'll be like, oh, oh whatever. Hey, pra, pa, hey. Like, men and brethren, what shall we do? Yeah, you almost want to run to your MC and say, I don't know what to do in that situation. The person is vibrating. You didn't know you were anointed. When you are in familiar environments, get out. Get out! There is greatness in you. There is a ministry in you. Don't let it die by you staying in the same place. Go, 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 go to Samaria. Yeah, these guys were in a school the other day, right? Didn't you see a, a, an awesome response? Do you think if you are here with all these people who think these are our people, you would see the same thing? No. Yeah. We need to go to schools. Every school. Just preach the gospel. Give children hope. Some of them, they've been neglected. They, they have suffered. They have been abused. They've been told all sorts of wrong things about themselves. When you show up and say, you know what? God loves you. You're awesome. You have a great future. No one is speaking into their lives. We must go. Anointed you, let me tell you. Salvage your anointing. Get up and go. 
just go buy a, a, a loudspeaker. <sighs> Are you with me? Yeah. And then Peter went to Cornelius' house and the gospel now reached the Gentiles as Jesus had predicted. Amen. Okay. Seven ways to do evangelism. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't want you to leave, I don't want to leave you helpless. They've told us to go. Where do I go? How do I go? With whom do I go? Which do I go? No. Seven ways to do evangelism. The first one is one on one. One on one evangelism. Okay. In one on one evangelism, there are two styles. One is stranger. Eh? You are there in the taxi and you, you feel something coming in you you won't say to all hey I'm come here but hey I'm ready to rock on my sock very well yes so I'm a sadie I'm pony baby you see once you open your mouth you can't shut it <laughs> it has begun you have to go through with it yeah one-on-one -on -one. strangers God, you just be there like Philip and uh, Ethiopian eunuch. God leads you and you just know, I need to talk to this person. I need to find out. And God usually makes a way. He shows you what's going on with the person. Maybe they are worried about something and God will tell you. Yeah. The easiest way is to tell your story. Yeah. See. Let me tell you a story. This is how my life was. This is what God did. This is how I am. This is where I'm going. You two can come along. Yeah. The other side of one-on-one -on -one is relational evangelism. When you've built the relationship with a person over time and they've seen your character, your way of life, and they're like, I want what you have. Most people who come to Christ are led to Christ this way one-on-one -on -one contact so that's why you must participate in it the second is door to door of course it's an element of one-on-one -on -one. it's just that this time you, you can even go two by two like jesus sent them two by two door to door look chapter 10. clunk 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 zone five eh? Eh, sunday afternoons how many people have given their lives to Christ since they have begun through the, the roughly? There are 406 as of end of April. The guy has the numbers on his fingertips. 406 people, door to door. You see, the reason I asked him to give you the numbers is so that you, you know that he didn't die in the process. Because when you tell people about door to door, they just see themselves in a coffin. They're like, that is one sure way of killing me. Yeah, I'm dead. Door to what? Dead. Yeah, no, it's not door to death. It's door to door. Yeah. <laughs> they are still here. They are alive. And all their members are alive. No one has died doing door to door evangelism. You know? Do we have any records of deaths? No. Yeah. House to house, shop to shop, room to room if you are in a hostel or in a hall of residence. Are you ready to do door to door? Yeah. The first time I did door to door, my God. Main CU missions, we go to Mukono, deep down there. Nowadays it's no longer so deep, by the way. Chisoga, what, all those places. And I thought we are going to do crusades, you know, rain had bonky stuff. And me, I'm on the sound team, set up, be around, mug equipment. The next morning, we reached at night like 10 p.m. So I'm thinking, yeah, surely, by about 5 o'clock, we'll have set up for the public meeting. Now we are all going for door to door. I said, death has come. <laughs> I don't even know the first verse to use. Yeah, that's when I learned about John 3.16, Romans 10.10, 2 10, Corinthians, about what? The word is near you. 
Today is the day of salvation. Three verses, armed with three verses and someone else who I hoped was more proficient in this thing than me, we set out home to home. Gatu sumurule njiri muruganda. Eh, mukama yeba zibwe. Amanya ne dobozi. Yeah. So please go join your MC and you do that. The third one is through missional communities where you go out together. It can be different. It can be one person, you're going door to door, what street, etc. But that's effective and it's the most effective method we've used here at Worship Harvest. We're having more than 500 people receive Christ per week through the missional communities. Yeah. So, MCs lead people to Christ, either door-to-door, -door, invitation, etc. The fourth method is special events. You put on a special event, invite people. Sometimes it might be an event that addresses people's needs, yeah? Like one of these days we can do, yeah. Hmm? Like we did 2030 gathering. Yeah, people received Christ in 2030 gathering. You can do uh, how to keep your marriage hot. Yeah. yeah. That one, eh? All, eh? all the men will pay. <laughs> Before even finding out what temperature are we talking about, <laughs> when you say hot, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, if, if we did how to keep your marriage hot, who would, who would show up? Me, I, I would definitely show up. Who else? All the others, they want their marriage to stay cold. Over cool. Hey, others need to first get the marriage going. Okay. Small omission there. Yeah. Maybe we first do how to get hooked. And then... Uh, uh, small, small jokes among friends. So it's special events. You can do special events and then people come and receive... Christ. The other is open air meetings, what they call crusades. Crusades are a bad word, but if you redeem it, this is where you have mass evangelism with, with a lot of planning and coordination and resources. This one costs money, a lot of money. I have a friend who does crusades. It costs him about 250 million each crusade. Yeah, for me, campaign. Bishop Doug's crusades cost in the region of $250,000 upwards per campaign. Yeah. It's hectic stuff. But it is it's the one where they rake in like thousands in one go. So you have to have a lot of good coordination with the local churches so that afterwards people can be connected to churches. Right? And then there's service evangelism. You just serve people, frontiers. Fix the water, dig the well, etc. And then people say, why are you doing this? Like Jesus. Where is he? He's right here. Do you want him? Yeah. And then seven, church planting. Church planting, I believe, is one of the most effective ways to do evangelism because new churches are ten times more effective at reaching non-believers than old churches. That's researched. Ten times. Ten times. No effective. New churches. Why? Because they have to get people to grow. The added advantage with church planting is that there is a system for discipling the people who have got saved. And then it can act as an outpost to send people further into the, into the place. Does that make sense? So I don't know which one of these you fancy, but they all are good and they all work. And I like the way Pastor Gerard talked about this. He said, you see, every good army has different kinds of weapons. So don't take your preferred method and you tell the other people theirs doesn't work. No. You need aerial bombing, carpet bombing, surface-to-air missiles, air to surface, infantry, tanks, 
armored personnel vehicles. What else? Why are people looking at me like I'm talking about Rolex? Yeah. yeah. Submarines, ships, all kinds of what? Weapons. So you can't be armed with only one. They come and tell you door to door. Uh -uh. Me, me, I only do mass evangelism. Mass. We are bombers. We bomb large areas. You can't win the war like that. To take territory, you need different weapons and different methods and strategies. And different people who are well equipped in those different ways. Does it make sense? Yeah. Because as long as we are stuck on only inviting people to Christ at garage, we had very little numbers. We were not winning. Now that we've put in the element of missional committees, which are very adaptive because they can do one-on-one, -on -one, they can do door-to-door, -door, they can do service evangelism. Some of them are about to start doing crusades. I think actually some people are already doing them. And special events. Ah, it looks like we're about to start going somewhere. Amen. Now, let me tell you about worship harvest as I close. At worship harvest, we mostly do evangelism through missional communities. And our strategy is to have one missional community lead one person to Christ every week. And then invite that person into the missional community. Just like when you go give birth in the hospital, you don't leave the kid in the hospital. You bring them home. Because the person who gets saved is a spiritual baby. You don't leave the spiritual baby out there to be eaten by dogs, a.k.a. the devil. You bring them into the missional community and love them and nurture them and teach them to read their Bible, teach them to pray, teach them how to live life until they mature and grow and experience the joy that's in the Lord. Amen. So that's what we do. And our vision... I see a future. I see a future. Can I tell you the future I see? 50,000 missional communities. In a thousand locations. We are well on our way. We are above 400 MCs now. So 50,000 is not out of reach. You see, if you are going to Charlie Wajala, you have to take the first step. However far it feels to you. You see, when you are younger, places look far. Mm. Those of us who have been around a bit, we know that there are things that are achievable, which if I tell you, you'll think, what? Yeah. 50,000 MCs. If we have 50,000 missional communities leading 50,000 people to Christ a week, do you know what's going to happen? A revolution. It's going to be completely mind-blowing change. Because it means that at that stage, if you lead 50,000 people to Christ, even if you said a location is 500 people, those will be 100 locations potentially per week. Our only challenge will be leaders. So you are the leaders. Everyone here, you are the bishops of the future, overseeing hundreds of locations. Just don't say no to it. I can tell you, it's the best life ever. Amen. Amen. So that's the future I see. Let's pray. Just just seated as we pray for a moment this morning. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and grace. Thank you that you've called us as a church to be evangelistic, to invite people to a living knowledge of you. So we bless you. We praise you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is present to heal, present to deliver today, present to provide solutions for where we are at our wit's end. Thank you, Lord, because you're healing hearts. Thank you because you're mending brokenness, even this morning. I sense that there are people who are experiencing pain in your heart. Not in a physical sense, maybe even in a physical sense, but there's just brokenness. We live in a broken world. Things rarely go the way we expect them to. And sometimes that can leave us devastated. 
And the Father wants to heal you this morning. He wants to do a work in you. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, just receive it where you are. Allow God to minister to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Thank you, Lord. The other get, sense I get is that there are people who have been in extreme need. You know, there is, all of us, we have more vision than resources. But I'm not even talking about vision. I'm talking about basics. Where you feel like the situation is oppressive because even basics are becoming hard to come by. I believe God has a miracle for you today. I don't know how he'll perform it, but I've seen him do it so many times. For me and for others, he will provide. He will provide. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We bless you. Be exalted. Be exalted. And if you're sick in any part of your body, we speak healing to you. We command healing. The Bible declares the Lord will command blessing upon your bread and your water and take sickness out of your midst. So we speak to sickness to cease to operate in your life, in your organs, on your skin, in your head. Command that headache to die down now to cease to be so we bless you thank you lord even as we pray if you can just pray in the spirit wherever you are that will be a blessing thank you jesus thank you lord so if you are if you are experiencing any of those things that i've talked about if you could just stand and I'll pray with you briefly as the rest of us sit and we'll continue in prayer and then we'll be concluding the, the service. Just stand where you are. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and grace. Thank you for meeting our needs at our point of need. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for healing our bodies. Thank you for healing our pain. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. Thank you for my brothers and sisters, Lord, who might be experiencing any or one of these things I've talked about. I speak blessing over them, even those of you in other locations and in uh, hosting centers, or even if you're at home, and one of the things I've talked about is you, whether at home, at work, just stand where you are as we pray. Thank you because you're the miracle-working God and there's nothing impossible with you. You're not limited by distance, so we bless you thank you we speak total complete deliverance we speak miraculous provision may people come in contact with the people who i need who will be able to help them out because you've positioned us as brothers and sisters to help one another thank you lord for whom you're using to do that thank you for healing all kinds of sickness your word declares you went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with you, Lord Jesus. May that be the same this morning. Your word declares that where two or three or more are gathered, you are in their midst. So we receive that. We receive that. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. And thank you, Father, for healing our hearts. You want us to have hearts that are able to love and to receive love. And incidences through life often bring us to a place where our hearts are crushed. And we don't know how to receive love or how to love. I speak healing, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Please, you may have your seats. Thank you, Lord. You may have your seats. I'm going to invite one last category of people to stand as we pray. Everyone continue. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. God is good. Amen. So both here in the studio and online and anywhere else where you are, I don't want to end this service without giving you an opportunity to walk to start your walk with Jesus I remember that day I gave my life to Christ I was in secondary school a friend a schoolmate came he was one class above me and shared with me and told me even though my parents were Christians even though I came from a Christian home I needed to have my own relationship 
And after he talked to me, I accepted Jesus. He prayed with me a short prayer. And my life has never been the same. That can be the same for you. So wherever you are, if you're there, I know you're there. I know you're here. Wherever you are, please stand up and we pray if you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time today. Just stand right where you are. Just stand right where you are. We are ready and willing to receive you. Just stand where you are. Yes, both here in the studio and the people in the hosting centers and the people at home where you are. If you are somewhere and you can't stand, you can put your hand up. Just put your right hand up wherever you are. If you can't stand, maybe you are at home, you're watching, and you feel awkward standing when there are three of you. Well, that's okay. And we are going to pray. Now, wherever you are, if you're standing or your hand is up, just pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. I give my life to you. Take my life and do something significant with it. Amen. If, if you prayed that prayer, I believe you are born again. You started a new journey with God. There is going to be a number on your screen. There's a number on your screen. 0775 Just go ahead and text that number or call that number. There is a pastor on the other end of that line to receive you. We receive many texts and calls every week. So we are, we are waiting for you. Those of you in the hosting centers and locations, make sure you talk to your pastor or your hosting center host if you've made this decision today amen thank you so much for coming out to garage today may god bless you amen